Hello everyone. Good evening. Welcome to the Art History Live session. Um, I'm just reading a message from Hannah, one of our instructors, who is the uh, inspiration behind this entire series. So she's not feeling well. She's going to sit back and uh, be a passive participant. But I'm going to call her out on that. Anyway, um, if everybody can hear me all right, please give me the little uh, yellow hand up. Chantel, Jim, excellent. Leanne, there should be a little yellow hand with a red arrow. Naomi, thank you. Uh, okay, well, I'm going to assume. Okay, Rachel says yes, and Naomi also says yes, and you raise your hand. Thank you. All right, well, I'm going to assume everybody can hear me fine then. Uh, so. I am just going to give you a brief little background on what happened. Uh, this is from earlier this month. Um, it's always surprising when you'll find some connection to art history that you weren't expecting to find. Uh, uh, how many of you have taken the Art 1000 course before? If you can give me a raised hand or a comment in the questions area is fine. Naomi and Jim. Have either taken it or are taking it either way. So a couple of you. Um, and Chantel as well. Okay. So a few of you. Um, well, you know that we, towards the end, we have a, a section where you're kind of meant to do some research and then identify the function of a work of art. One of those functions, of course, is to um, convey a social or political message. So tonight we've got a very politically charged uh, image, uh, actually two images. Uh, oh, well, actually there's a couple more than that. Um, but two images that we're going to look at. But what I want to do is try to, you know, I'm a instructor, my PhD is in American Studies, so I do a lot of um, research and analysis and critique of the history of American culture and uh, you know how we've gotten from the uh, origins of our colonial period to today and I'm sure you're all uh, maybe feeling a little <laughs> uh, if not overwhelmed maybe entertained by the current uh, political situation we're in in any case there's a lot of, of there's a lot of messages flying back and forth and uh, one that struck me quite, uh, I don't know what the word is I should use, one that struck me, let's say, uh, happened to, I think, come out on Valentine's Day, which is an irony I hadn't thought about until a couple of days ago, but I, I think it was February 14th. And it was an image that we're going to look at shortly, and I'm going to give you some context before we get there. Um, but it brought up some, some themes that are, are quite typical in American studies, and this would be cultural appropriation. And in this case, we also have a, a, an instance of what I would call artistic appropriation. And you're all familiar with this, whether these terms are familiar to you or not, but they are, this is something that you would associate, say, with Andy Warhol. Uh, he takes a, a photograph of, um, like a, a studio photograph of Marilyn Monroe from the film Niagara and then turns it into a screen print and reproduces it over and over and over and over. And you've all seen that that screen print of Marilyn Monroe. You've probably seen 10, 15 different versions of it. Uh, he did the same with Campbell's Soup and the same with Coca-Cola bottles and the same with Elvis Presley and the same with, uh, you know, a dozen other celebrities and, and Brillo boxes and other uh, uh, consumer goods as well. So that's what we mean by artistic appropriation, where an artist takes some other work, it could be another artist's work, and then transforms it and turns it into something of their own, or maybe takes something that exists out there in the, the wider culture, maybe a pop culture, an advertisement, or again, say a, a photograph of a celebrity or whatever. Um, we might also recognize the work of uh, another pop artist, Roy Lichtenstein, who did those uh, paintings of comic books, romance comic books was his favorite, I think, uh, from the 30s, and painted them on large scale, you do the Bende dots and all of that, and he changed the 
uh, the text bubble and make it you know, something similar to what he would see in those comic books. But he made it his own. But that's what we mean. So it's appropriating existing uh, cultural artifacts and then kind of turning them into something new uh, and novel. Um, so that would be the artistic appropriation side. The other thing that we can talk about is cultural appropriation. Um, perhaps the most uh, typical or, or well-known might be, say, uh, the example of Eminem or, say, a white rapper or white hip-hop artist, uh, Macle, uh, what's his name, Macklemore. Um, you know, that might, some people would accuse white hip-hop or hip-hop artists or rappers as take, taking on a, a form of cultural appropriation, appropriating a traditionally African-American uh, cultural form uh, for themselves. You could look back to the, the, the blues, uh, the Beatles or the, the Rolling Stones taking uh, blues um, music and, and kind of turning it into a new rock and roll version. Uh, that might have been more palatable to, to white audiences at the time. But that's what we mean by cultural appropriation. So it's a very similar um, uh, action or, or activity. Uh, it's just that we're, we're looking more at uh, one being specifically within the art, the realm of art, uh, the other one being more broadly uh, defined as, as, as cultural. Of course, you know, art falls within culture, but I'm going to make that distinction tonight because we're going to talk about two different things that are happening simultaneously. <sighs> all right. Uh, I sent you all through the chat. There's a link there. I wrote an article. So if you want to go back and look at this in more detail and maybe in a more polished form than I might be giving this evening, you can certainly take a look at that. Uh, there's links to lots of uh, uh, source material, articles from newspapers and whatnot, and links to videos. Uh, so if you want to look at that later or share it with friends or whatever, that's fine with me. There's the password I also sent for tonight. Our password will be Ruby. You'll understand why in a little bit. All right, so any questions, please uh, type them into the questions area. If you would like to, I'm more than happy to take you off of mute if you'd like to actually ask questions. Um, in this particular uh, environment, I really encourage you to actually do that. I think it's a lot easier. We've got a small group. Uh, there's going to be a lot of questions that might come up, and you might not be able to type fast enough uh, to get the, the, the question out before I move ahead. I can talk fast and uh, bloviate on and on and on and on. All right, so let's start tonight. Tonight, or to, before we get started, I just want to give you some context. Um, and part of the reason I'm doing this is because we're uh, coming down to the last two days of Black History Month, so this is something that I think resonates very well, uh, and it's a nice way to maybe round out the month and e explore some, some issues that are a little sensitive, but I think need to be discussed and, and makes for a healthy conversation and discourse about race, race relations, cultural appropriation, and the types of messages that are being um, transmitted or broadcast in this uh, very, I would say, tumultuous period in our political uh, history. I'm assuming you are all feeling that on some level or another, Just, you know, regardless of your uh, political dispositions. It's clearly a very tense moment in American history. Um, so, if you do or do not know who Betsy DeVos is, that's fine, I will explain. Uh, Betsy DeVos is from my home state of Michigan. She is from Holland. She's the wife of Bill DeVos, who is the founder of Amway uh, Corporation. You may have heard of Amway. Um, I don't know what the nice word is. It's, it's, a, it's not a pyramid scheme, but it is a, something like that. <laughs> um, I, Somebody can give me the correct term. I can't think of it right now. Um, but you know, you buy into it, you buy products, and then you try and sell it to other people. Uh, anyway, the, it's it's a very uh, successful business. The DeVosses are um, uh, major players in the city of Grand Rapids, for example. Uh, they put a lot of money into the arts and theater. Uh, so there, there's a lot of philanthropy that goes on as well. Betsy DeVos was uh, recently uh, confirmed, uh, barely, uh, you may have seen this, she was confirmed by a tie-breaking vote uh, by 
Vice President Mike Pence, who, uh, because he's Vice President, in the case of a tie, he has he gets to vote and then he can break that tie. So confirmation for the first time. This is a very strange thing in American history. It's the first time we've ever had a tie breaking and the need for a tiebreaker uh, in a confirmation hearing. So it's a little strange. Um, she's somewhat controversial because she is a proponent of private and charter schools and vouchers. Um, so she's very often seen as a, a, an enemy or an opponent of public schools, public school funding, uh, public teaching, teachers, teacher unions, etc. Uh, which is part of the reason why she had a hard time getting confirmation. So earlier this month, I believe this happened on the the tenth, first or second week of, of February. So this is all this is all very recent. You may have heard about this. You may not. Um, so after her confirmation, she uh, went to visit a public school in Washington, D.C. She was, however, greeted with a, not a huge crowd, but a sizable crowd of protesters. This is, after, this is in the, uh, the um, back parking lot. And this is at the back entrance of the school. Uh, you can kind of see, I hope everybody can see my screen, yes. Multi-level marketing. Thanks, Jim and Hannah. Uh, Chantal says boosters. I'm not sure what you're referring to there, but if you want to uh, give me some details, I'll, I'll read it off to everybody. Um, so this is after there was a, a much larger crowd up front. A few of those people had gotten into this back section of the the school in the parking lot. You can see that you know there's a public street out there, and there's a, a fence. Um, separating the, the sidewalk from the, the school. Uh, so Betsy DeVos tried to visit a public school in Washington, D.C. This was early in the month, and she was turned away by this small group of pro protesters, many of whom, or some of whom, were parents uh, and teachers at the school. Um, so it wasn't, it wasn't just uh, you know, people who were there to simply protest Betsy DeVos for no reason other than to protest. Um, so th these were people who were directly related to um, directly related to the, the school itself. So this was this was the outcome. This is very short. I just want to show you what what happened, and that way I can explain the images we're going to look at and why I'm considering this to be a form of artistic appropriation that isn't probably the best route to go. So here I will hit play. You're not Yeah, so this is a little hard to hear what they're saying. Uh, the, 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 the protester that you saw there was simply saying, uh, he's saying shame, obviously. You could probably hear shame at the end. Um, he was basically bringing up the point that DeVos, who's a billionaire, I mean, the family, they're billionaires, um, estimated worth of well over $5 billion. Um, had given, she and the DeVos family had given something like $200 million to uh, Senate campaigns in uh, uh, the U.S. Senate. So he was basically alluding to the fact that that money that was given to them for their, their political campaigns were the reason why she was given the appointment and confirmed as the, the Secretary of Education. So he was saying, shame, shame, because uh, um, from his point of view, it was kind of a pay-for-play situation. Um, I don't know. I'll try and turn it up, Hannah. I don't know how else to. I mean, this is the first time I've actually used uh, embed codes in a PowerPoint, and I don't think it's gonna. I can turn up my speakers. I thought it would play through the. Um, I thought it would play through the, the uh, PowerPoint itself, but. Anyway, 
I will. You get the basic idea. So she, you know, she seems a little rattled. She's being escorted. I am assuming this is a Secret Service agent uh, back to the armored uh, SUV that is kind of standard uh, issue for government officials. So after this event, you know, and this is you can see that the protester here is. Uh, carrying a Black Lives Matter. Of course, Washington, D.C., if you're not aware of this, Washington, D.C. is predominantly a black city, um, at least residents. Uh, so you've got a combination of a lot of things here. You've got a, a, a person who seems to be uh, an opponent of public school and public school funding. You've got a woman who is extremely wealthy and barely was confirmed. Uh, it, there was a lot of public funding, or a lot of funding from her family and instant, or foundation to Republicans in the Senate. So all of these things are kind of swirling around. Then you've got the racial issue on top of it, a predominantly black school. Uh, so he's got the Black Lives Matter uh, sign. All of these things are kind of coming together um, around this individual. So there was, shortly thereafter, this is the... Um, uh, image that was produced is a political cartoon. You've all seen political cartoons. This was um, printed in the Belleville News Democrat, which is a, a, a newspaper. Um, uh, it was titled Trying to Trash Betsy DeVos. It's by Glenn McCoy from February 13th, 2017. Hold on, let's take a look at that. And, and I'm going to ask you to I'm going to, I have to let my cat in real quick. I'm going to ask you to start commenting on what you see and what you think that this is uh, the message that's being conveyed here. You can see a little bit, obviously, from the, um, the title, but think about what you're looking at and go ahead and type it in. I'm going to mute this for a second. I've got to open up a squeaky window. Sorry, I was talking. Sorry, <laughs> uh, Hannah, I was. Um, let me go back. Hold on. I was repeating. Okay, so Jim started out with it portrays DeVos as a small person uh, and a conservative. So she's clearly diminutive, right? She's smaller than the four figures surrounding her. And we can see one, two, three, four uh, suited figures. Um, then... Uh, he also, Jim said that she's being uh, described as a conservative, and he's suggesting this because of the spray painted graffiti on the back wall here and behind her, or to the right of her. Uh, Chantel says she's trying to fit in with her wallet. Now, I think, Chantel, what you're describing is this, and I think this is just a notebook that she's carrying, and the this is an artistic device by McCoy to identify who it is we're looking at. So he's just giving us a clue as to who this character is or who this figure is. Um, but I think that she, it's just a notebook and it's a device he's using. It's a prop, basically. Um, Jim goes on to say, surrounded by by big men, and they are they definitely look. You know, their suits are kind of baggy and um, clearly much much larger. 
And that's going to be important in a second when we do our comparison. Uh, Naomi says, I see the symbol in the background uh, like she's an atheist. Um, probably not. Uh, I think the atheist alludes to a, a different group of people, the people who are opposing her. So I think the uh, what McCoy is representing here are those protesters who are kind of atheists or um, kind of fanatics. You may have heard about those uh, riots that happened at, at UC Berkeley when uh, Milo came to town and he wasn't allowed to speak. Uh, they blamed um, some of those the, the uh, destructive um, rioting that occurred on a, an atheist group. So I think he's making that connotation that those who opposed her uh, at the school were atheists or atheist anarchists. Sorry, atheist too probably. <laughs> Uh, Kendall said, oh wait, hold on. Oh, Naomi did say atheist. Actually, that's the anarchist symbol. I'm sorry. I'm confusing everything here. Um, but yeah, it's the group, I think, that the, that the artist is alluding to there. Chantel says, uh, also her blue suit signifies kind of a silver spoon and wealth. Um, she's definitely very well dressed. Her hair is perfectly coiffed. Um, and of course, she's got bodyguards, so she's, she's definitely important as well. Uh, Kendall says, in reality, she may not be as powerful and intimidating as she seems. That's very interesting. I mean, clearly McCoy here um, is, I think, depicting her as a victim, right? That she's, she's somewhat uh, defenseless. Um, and I think, you know, you kind of got that a little bit. I think her reaction and response was a, was a um, you know, she was a little, I think, scared or at least um, kind of shocked by what was going on. I, I, she wasn't anticipating it. And I'm sure she's never really dealt with something quite like that. You know, this is new territory for her. Um, Naomi says, NEA means something. You're absolutely right. Anybody have any thoughts on that? Sorry, I'm, I'm scrolling through. I have a lot of one line anar or one line comments. A lot of you saying anarchy, anarchist, anarchy, anarchy. Uh, NEA absolutely is very, there Jim's got it, National Education Association. So this is, this is a uh, uh, teachers union basically. This is a national, the National Association for Education. Um, but it's a teachers union, teachers advocacy, public education advocacy. Uh, so he's kind of, he's kind of alluding to the NEA as being an enemy or opponent of DeVos, as well as the anarchists who were responsible for the protest. That's what he's saying. So it was a group of, of, say, NEA types and a group of anarchists. And of course, the anarchists would be the most likely the guy holding the Black Lives uh, Matter sign this was uh, chanting shame, shame, shame in the video. Um, Naomi continues and says, maybe she feels uh, small in a world that is mostly men leaders. Oh, that's interesting. Um, certainly, I think, you know, again, the, the this is coming from McCoy. So this is his uh, representation of what he was seeing and what he kind of felt like was happening to her. So from his point of view, maybe he's seeing her as... Um, kind of small in this this new world or a world that she's not typically been a part of. Um, you know, she's lived she's lived a fairly sheltered life. You know, you don't she, her family. She was born into a great amount of wealth and married into and continued to grow that wealth. So you know, she's she's definitely not like you and me here. Um, Jordan says, "Is that food thrown?" Yes. So this is a tomato. So it's been hit. It hits the wall here, splattered, fell, and then fell down to the ground below. Okay. So I think you pretty much covered everything that we're looking at here, and a good sense of what the artist is conveying. And I agree with everything that you've said. So again, I think we're looking at DeVos as a. The artist is kind of depicting her as a victim. Um, now, when I saw this, I knew exactly what he was alluding to, uh, and you know, 
because I'm an art historian and I teach cultural studies and American studies and you know that's that involves the history of class and race and ethnicity and gender and sexual orientation and pop culture and all of these things kind of rolled up into one um, I was a little uh, I had a reaction uh, and it was kind of a gut reaction and it wasn't particularly positive and I want to explain why so for those of you who might be looking at this and don't make any other uh, further association, there's not really much there to unpack. There's not much there that you can really say, oh, that's, that's not quite right. Well, I'm hopefully going to convince you that it's not quite right and explain why. And it's not so much the, the message itself, um, because I did feel, you know, I sympathize with, with, with what Glenn McCoy is saying or trying to say. And I felt a bit of compassion for DeVos, just, you know, just trying to, to go out and, and meet people at a public school and meet with the administration and um, you know, maybe meet with teachers and, and have a conversation. Um, but I also very, very deeply understand why uh, she represents a, an existential threat to teaching, to teachers, to public schools. Uh, I'm not going to get into detail, but you know, I just trust that I have my reasons. And look her up, and you can make your own. I'm not going to tell you that you should have those exact same reasons, because I can tell you why I don't think this is a good thing, even if you agree with her uh, uh, educational policies or philosophy. Um, so let's explore this a little bit further. So when this cartoon came out, it caused a storm of you know, <laughs> tweets. Uh, there was a Twitter war. People were just uh, left and right sending in their own uh, commentary on that particular image to the um, the newspaper, the Belleville News Democrat. So one of these Twitter users, uh, he felt compelled to make minor additions. So this was from uh, Jason Pollock, uh, and he said, "Hey." Uh, I left something out of the political cartoon you ran, so I fixed it for you guys. Maybe you'll run it. Obviously, he added uh, the Nazi armbands. So he's making a counter appropriation, right? You understand how that works, right? Uh, and you'll understand where that original image came from. But he's appropriating the, the image by McCoy and adding these to create a difference. Um, message right so it's no longer that these four figures are kind of protecting her uh, who might be secret service as we saw in the video but they are Nazis that are protecting her so this is a, another uh, transformation of the message by a, a, a user or a Twitter um, writer a tweeter <laughs> I don't even know how to explain how to use these words uh, Chantel says that explains the anger. Yeah, there's no question. Um, uh, I think that the response, and you'll have to understand, you'll understand more, Chantel. I'm, I'm, we're just getting started here. So let's take a look at um, the statement from the artist because he got all of this really negative, negative comments uh, coming from the, the Twitterverse. Um, and the vast majority of it was was very negative. And again, I, I, I completely understand why. I mean, I had a negative reaction to it too. And again, you'll understand why in a second. But I want to I want you to also know that, you know, there's a it, it doesn't mean that the when we get to the end and you're looking at this, I want you to remember it doesn't mean that, that what McCoy was trying to convey was wrong. Because uh, I agree with most of what he's saying here. And I'm going to read this for you. Uh, he says, my cartoon was about how, in this day and age, decades beyond the civil rights protests, it's sad that people are still being denied the right to speak freely or do their jobs or enter public buildings because, because others disagree with who they are or how they think, he wrote. I'm not surprised that you see hate in this cartoon when I thought I was speaking out against hate. It's a woman passively walking while being protected from angry protesters isn't that what went down the other day when DeVos visited the school to do her job? You may disagree with her on issues, but I didn't see any hate coming from her. 
I did, however, see hate going in the other direction, which is what made me think of the Rockwell image. That was the only comparison I was drawing. The level of toxicity in today's political climate has reached ridiculous levels. And I agree with that. I, mean, I, I think that the, the partisan uh, divide, the, the vitriol from one side to the other, the hatred, the anger, um, you know, the name calling, it, it's gotten really bad and unhealthy. And, you know, it concerns me as an American, as a citizen. Um, and I am definitely not, and <laughs> I definitely disagree with DeVos on the issue, no doubt about it. Um, but I don't, I'm not one that kind of engages in this type of uh, name calling, and, and I always try to see the other side. However, uh, I think that there are some things that McCoy was not uh, aware of or uh, sensitive enough to, or uh, was unable to predict, you know, if he had sent this to me and said, hey, what do you think? I would have said, I would not, <laughs> I would not necessarily expect that you're going to make a lot of friends by <laughs> creating this and publishing it. Uh, and again, I think you'll understand why. And I don't know, you know, I don't know this person. I don't know McCoy. I don't know what's in his heart. I, do, I doubt very much he's a, you know, a bad person or an evil person. I don't think that at all. I want to make that really, really clear. Um, however, <laughs> it doesn't mean that there aren't deep criticisms that can be leveled against the image and the choice that he made here. Uh, what I disagree with as well is that I didn't really see hate so much coming from uh, the protesters as much as, like Chantel said, anger, frustration, um, a, 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 uh, a lack of, of uh, ability to, to do anything other than speak your mind, really. But I didn't really see hate. I, I saw, uh, you know, people who were really upset about uh, this person, Betsy DeVos, being in a role that many people felt that she was completely unqualified for, and in some ways represented the opposite of what the Department of Education is supposed to do. Anyway. So I'm going to get to the, the, the image. I just want you to, I'm trying to unveil it slowly um, so that you'll, you'll get a sense of this all at once. Uh, so Rockwell goes through a transformation. You've all seen, you've all seen Norman Rockwell. Whether you know it or not, you've all seen it. Um, he did covers for the Saturday Evening Post for 50 plus years. Uh, he was just a part of the cultural fabric of the United States through the great, I mean, as far back as World War I. I think one of his first uh, covers was a World War I cover. Uh, but certainly all the way through the Depression, World War II, uh, into the 50s, uh, you know, he was, he's very often kind of derided as an a, a Americana artist, an illustrator, a commercial artist, not a fine artist, uh, kitschy. Um, and... It, you know, it's true. If you look at his, he's a very gifted artist, no question about it. Fantastic artist. But he was an illustrator, you know, and he was working for the Saturday Evening Post, which is a very middle of the road, uh, middle America, heartland type of a, a, a periodical. Um, so his images were very often of, you know, white, middle class, uh, um, small town. America, uh, cute, you know, little kids uh, playing in the dirt, and, uh, families having Thanksgiving, and people sitting around the barber shop, stuff like that. Just nothing controversial whatsoever about it. Well, at the end of the 50s, his, third, his second wife dies, and he gets remarried. His new wife is uh, a very progressive woman. She's kind of a political firebrand. This is coming. This is in the midst of the civil rights movement, and she's she really pushes him hard to begin tackling important social and cultural issues in his art. You know that he can't just continue doing this kind of uh, saccharine, sugary uh, type of imagery. And and she really pushed him to to. Uh, use his art for good, uh, to, to transform American thinking on issues such as race in particular. Um, so he quits 
the Saturday Evening Post after decades and takes up um, a position at Look Magazine. And Look Magazine is no longer around, but Look Magazine was kind of like life, but much more progressive, tackling these issues of you know gender inequality and racism and class issues and things like that, poverty, those types of things. Um, and his very first illustration for Look was published in 1964, and it's called The Problem We All Live With. Now, some of you may now recognize what it is we're talking about or have an inkling. Uh, this was based on the real-life story of Ruby Bridges, hence our password tonight, uh, a six-year-old girl who in 1960, so this is four years before, had become the first, and this is important, the first African-American child to integrate an all-white school in New Orleans. Um, so this was a precedent-setting precedent set, precedent moment in the civil rights movement, uh, in the school integration. Um, you know, this is before the, the Little Rock Nine, um, and it's a six-year-old. You know, she's going to kindergarten, or maybe it was first grade. I think it was kindergarten. Um, so this, this is a really radical departure for Rockwell. He never did anything controversial. He never really did anything political or, or this socially engaged. Um, and he was deeply, I mean, this Rockwell loved America, and this was what he did for all of his life. Um, so he, he took on something that was, I think, difficult for him. Um, but, so in an uncompromisingly disturbing scene uh, of a pigtailed little innocent in a white dress walking straight ahead, preceded and trailed by pairs of faceless federal marshals, their bodies cropped off at the shoulder height to emphasize the girl's ultimate aloneness. All set against a backdrop of an institutional concrete wall defaced with graffiti, I'm not sure if that's a misspelling or, but, uh, oh, a graffito of the word nigger, I'm sorry, you're going to see it, and I'm going to say it and uh, a, the gory splatter of a tomato that somebody has hurled uh, the girl's way. And I'm going to show you the image. Now I want you to take a close look at what you're seeing here and compare it to what you saw in the cartoon. Because we've got the epithet, this what, the worst racial epithet in the English language, at least American English. So. Rockwell has put has done this in a you know grief, graffiti spray paint again on the wall. Instead of the N E A, what do you see? The K K K. Now you see the original. So he's got these are federal marshals. So adult males. You know they got their badges, their armbands, um, and they are escorting the six-year-old child, the first girl to integrate an all-white school, and she's the only one that goes to this school. She's the only black child in the entire school. So I want you to, I want you to let this sink in. Naomi, yes, this is the original painting by, well, I mean, it's a picture, obviously, but yeah, this is the original painting by Norman Rockwell. You can see his um, iconic signature down below. So what we're seeing here is this is the appropriation. I'm going to start with the artistic appropriation. I'm going to try and do this quickly because we're already at 8.40. Um, the artistic appropriation is McCoy having used this image to convey a message about current or contemporary events that he sees as being similar. Um, a, a girl here being blocked, well, attempted, she would have been blocked if she hadn't been escorted by U.S. Marshals, basically. Um, but he's making a comparison here between this event and what happened to Betsy DeVos. And I have a problem with that, and I'll try to explain why. Now, what he's done here is uh, also made an association between the National Education Association and the Ku Klux Klan. I also have a problem with that, and I'll explain why in a second. But this is Norman Rockwell's first really important uh, socially conscious political painting. And again, this comes really towards the end of his life, the last part of his career. The problem we all live with, and of course the problem we all live with is racism and segregation 
and Jim Crow South. Uh, and that's what he's drawing attention to here. And of course what he's done is, you know, he's used art in the best possible way uh, to take a real event and depict it in such a way as to heighten all of the, the tensions and the animosity and the hatred that, that comes with it. Um, you know, and you can imagine that that tomato was thrown just as she was passing by, so you know, maybe narrowly having missed her head. You know, and I think that's why he's left such a gap here to kind of give the indication that this just happened, um, and she doesn't even blink an eye. You know, so th this is what Norman I think is trying to give is trying to convey here. Um, so it's important to understand the significance of this to the history of civil rights this precedent-setting moment. So she's six years old, she becomes the first African-American child to integrate the white Southern Elementary School, or a white Southern Elementary School, having to be escorted to class by her mother and the U.S. Marshals on the first and second days. Her mother wasn't able to on the third day because she had to work. Um, and the reason they had to escort her is because there were violent mobs outside of the school for days. They were there in the morning. They were there in the afternoon. They were there the next day. They were there the next after that afternoon, and the day after that, and the day after that. So Bridges' bravery, and of course this was seen all over the, the country, all over the world really, but certainly all over the country these images were, were um, you know, the painting is coming four years later, but the images of that, those first days were broadcast all over the country, as were uh, news reports, you know, uh, live video, of the, well, they didn't call it video back then, but live uh, images, moving images. So <clears throat> her bravery uh, paved the way uh, for continued civil rights actions. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Remember, this is, this is happening in 1960. The following year, we get the Freedom Riders and then the Freedom Summer. Uh, the Freedom Riders were the those who the college students who and members of Corps who went down um, on interstate buses, the Greyhound and Trailways, to try to integrate uh, uh, the wait the uh, segregated waiting rooms at bus stations. So th this really begins a, 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 a really significant moment in the civil rights uh, era which also brings in the administration of uh, John F. Kennedy, which he, he and his administration had no desire to even get involved in civil rights. That was on the bottom of their list. They were really concerned about Russia and the Cold War and uh, nuclear proliferation in Cuba, for example. Um, so this is, you, you can't underestimate how important this moment is. Uh, and how significant that painting by Norman Rockwell is to those who were a part of the civil rights movement at the time. Um, and this is a beloved image. It's a beloved image, I think, for all Americans, but especially for African Americans. Uh, and Ruby Bridges is still alive today. She was honored just a few years ago um, uh, by the Obama administration, by President Obama and Michelle. Um, uh, and she's been honored over and over and over. Uh, she's very active in civil rights or the in civil rights today. Um, so you know she's 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 still around. You know, she's still doing well, healthy, vibrant. Um, but I want you to understand why now this would be somewhat offensive then to take this. I've got to fix this real quick. I apologize. I hate seeing mistakes. Here we go. So here's a picture. This is of the actual event. This is Ruby being escorted uh, in the morning to school. Here are four of the um, U.S. Uh, deputy marshals escorting her in. Um, there's local police, uh, New Orleans police, also outside. Uh, you can't see. They, they had the uh, area cordoned off with um, barricades, so the protesters are off in the, onto the sides. I've got one picture to show you. Uh, of that. Um, I couldn't find as many as I was hoping for and I was really crunched on time. Uh, this is another picture of her coming out of school at the end of the day, again being escorted to a car and taken away. Now this is only a few miles from her house. Why this is important, why it was being desegregated is the black school 
was miles away, several miles from her home. This was like four blocks. This school was four blocks from her home because it was a white school she wasn't allowed to attend. So without desegregation, she would have had to be bused or get, had gotten driven or walked four miles to the all-black school. So, and this was a very common circumstance for many um, uh, black families because they were black. The black schools tended to be far off and outside of or far away from white neighborhoods, etc. So, desegregation really begins to break down this um, this uh, Jim Crow segregation, the separate but equal rule. Um, if you can't hear this, Hannah, let me know. I'm going to turn up my speakers and hopefully that'll help. I don't know if it's going to work or not. Uh, if not, I could probably... Um, copy the video URL and I'll send it to you in the chat. So if, you, if anybody wants to view it, there it is. Can you see it, everybody? Okay, good. Um, so Naomi says, wow, what a, a very brave girl. Chantel says that's terrible and it had to be terrifying for her. Um, if, if you can't hear the description that Robert Cole makes here, uh, you have to watch this. Uh, and if you can't, I'll just, I'm just going to shut up and let everybody take a chance. It's only like four minutes. But to hear Robert Cole describe this, um, Chantel, you'd be amazed that young Ruby Bridges was not afraid at all. I mean, it brings tears to my eyes. She was not afraid at all. Um, so just, if you can hear this, let me know. If not, I'll let you look it up, okay? The was just afraid of hate and street violence. I don't think it's going to work. Can you hear this at all? I turned it down, but... They were trying to desegregate two elementary schools, and school girl was ordered by Fabio Jones to go into one of them. And she was there all by herself, the whole white population, and boycotted the school. No other children with her. And I happened to see this little child going into a school in New Orleans at the age of six to the first grade, I thought to myself, I would like to know that child. I'd like to know what's happening to her. One day, having now spent months getting to know Ruby and being rather puzzled at how normal and stoic and strong she was, going through this kind of living hell, 200 people waiting at 8.30 in the morning to tell her they were going to kill her. 200 people in the afternoon telling her they were going to kill her. 25 federal marshals taking her into that building. What would you expect? You'd expect that a child going through that would pretty soon start developing symptoms and be in trouble. I waited and waited and there weren't any symptoms and she kept going and learning and being the ruby that she was, a normal six-year-old black child, very poor background, parents didn't even know how to read and write. Humble people. One day, her school teacher said to me, and she didn't go out of the window, and she saw Ruby yet again coming to school. This time, she watched carefully, and she noticed that as Ruby was walking past this mall with heckling men and women, she stopped. And the teacher saw her lips moving. I said, Ruby, your teacher told me today that uh, she saw you talking to those people on the street. She said to me, Doctor, I told her that I wasn't talking to the people. I said, well, who were you talking to? Ruby? She said, I told her I was talking to God. Could you tell us, uh, tell our audience uh, why you took them out? Because I didn't want to go to school with the lady. Why were you praying to God? She said, I was praying for the people on the street. I said, why were you doing that movie? And she said, uh, well, because I wanted to pray for them. I said, you did want to pray for them? Yes, she said. I said, Ruby, well, why would you want to pray for those people? And she looked at me and her eyes widened and she said, well, don't you think they need praying for? 
Let's stop. I'm not going to go on because we're, we're going to run out of time. I really, please take the time to watch it. Um, if you couldn't hear it fully, um, what I wanted you to see was the crowds. Um, just how unruly and loud and angry they were. Um, the, Robert Cole was describing essentially that, that when she walked into the school, her teacher had seen her um, she, her teacher had seen her stop and, and looked like she was talking to somebody. She was actually praying, and she was praying for the people, the demonstrators, the people who were, you know, wishing her dead, essentially. Um, that many of the chants were saying basically that uh, in words that I probably shouldn't use. Um, but she was praying for them <laughs> because she felt that they needed to be prayed for. And, uh, you know, what, what Robert Cole goes on to describe is that she uh, was raised, and her, her parents were illiterate, had never gone to school, um, or didn't get very far in school, so her parents couldn't read and write. Um, and Ruby, you know, obviously this is, they wanted more for her, their daughter, but even in this environment of two parents who were poor and illiterate, they taught her what he was describing is they taught her this grace, uh, uh, just good Christian values, this simple Christian value of loving your enemies. And that was something that this six-year-old girl knew uh, intuitively and was able to draw on that as a means of uh, you know, harboring no fear harboring no resentment or bitterness or anger towards anybody. Um, and, you know, a six-year-old doesn't really understand fully what's going on, I'm sure, but at the same time, most six-year-olds I know would not be able to withstand that kind of a situation without kind of uh, breaking down in some way or another. Uh, but I, I really wanted you to see the reactions of the, the, the crowd first and then just understand you know, how ironic it is that a six-year-old girl was more mature than the hundreds of people standing around uh, wishing her dead. Uh, anyway, um, so I want to make three basic points here and why I find the uh, image by Glenn McCoy to be misguided, at least, uh, if not offensive. Um, and this is my perspective, so I, you know, I, I'm not saying that you should share it, but I, I think that it's worth having the conversation, and certainly something that, um, you know, as, as, a, as a society and as a, uh, as a people, we should be able to engage in these conversations and explain why uh, certain types of images or certain words can be, can be uh, offensive or hurtful or come across as hateful. Um, so I've got three points. The first one is, I would say to equate the treatment of a grown white woman holding public office, which if you hold public office, criticism and protest is just part of the job. You, you can't escape it. But to compare that situation to that of a black child going to an all-white southern school in the 1960s, the early 1960s in America, just to me is patently absurd and, and completely indefensible. There's no comparison. This is what we. This is a classic example of false equivalence. There is no equivalence to be made here. Um, the the basic idea of you know blocking somebody from entering a building and doing their job. Okay, that's one thing. But uh, this is a child who was trying to get an education, uh, and I, I just do not see any way to really defend making that type of a comparison. Number two. Um, Betsy DeVos, and I make this kind of a little joke, uh, she's a problem we all live with. Um, and again, that's my own personal uh, perspective on it. But she's a billionaire who her stated policy is to gut public schools. Stated policy. You can click on these if you go to my the article. You can, all of this is, is um, um, sourced. You can, you can find the, the support for this. So she, she is a billionaire who wants to gut public schools, and these are the very public schools that were desegregated. You can only desegregate public schools. You can't desegregate a private school. 
because they are private. <laughs> you, you can do what you want in a private school. Um, so it, it, it's the, the, the the false equivalency is is so beyond the pale here um, that it, it's difficult for me to get over it. <laughs> so you've got a billionaire who wants to gut public schools, public school funding, and these are the very schools that were desegregated so that Ruby Bridges would be able to go to a school that's five blocks from a home instead of several miles away to the all-black school. Um, and not only that, but the educational policies that DeVos supports, and again, you can look this up, whether intentional or not, they conjure up memories of this post-Brown uh, v. Board education era where strategies in the South uh, were intended to resegregate. Um, so here's, you know, this is what happened after the Board of uh, Brown versus the Board of Education in the South. Almost immediately after the Brown case, and this is what desegregated, uh, that said segregated schools, separate but equal institutions were unconstitutional. So shortly thereafter, immediately thereafter, white Southerners met uh, the decision with a massive res resistance. In Virginia, segregationist Democrats pushed sweeping educational changes to combat integration. In 1956, the Commission on Public Education, convened by uh, then Governor Stanley, asked the General Assembly in Virginia to repeal compulsory education, empower the governor to close public schools, and provide vouchers to parents to enroll their children in segregated private schools. In the next few years, whites would open segregated academies across the state while closing public schools to block integration. So this is why it is offensive to a great number of people um, on point two. Point three, this is again, I mean, it's happening in February, so I get it, but the artist releases this cartoon during Black History Month, which adds a further layer of irony and offense, in my opinion, for sure, and I'm sure lots of others, obviously, because you can look, you can see the tweet, the the, the Twitter responses. Um, uh, so these protests against DeVos occurred in February. So of course McCoy is going to make, you know, create a cartoon commenting on it during the time that is pertinent and, and still relevant. So it, it's a coincidence on some level, but the entire situation kind of smacks of a deep cultural insensitivity, uh, not taking into consideration all of these different facets. Um, and the image further falsely equates to me the worst racial epithet, which you saw, the N-word, um, scrawled across the back with that of conservative, as though these two are somehow equal. Uh, you know, you are a conservative by choice. Nobody's black by choice. Nobody's white by choice. You are born that way. Uh, you are you by choice become conservative or liberal, and you know it, 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 a completely different situation. It's a political uh, term as opposed to a racial term. Um, so to, to, to suggest the negative connotations associated with the label conservative is comparable in any way to the psychologically destructive term, the N word just is beyond belief. It defies credulity. Um, thank you, Naomi agrees. Uh, and again, I'm not trying to convince you that, that you have to think in these terms, but we have to come to, you know, and again, I want to reiterate 100% that I support McCoy's First Amendment right to engage in that kind of political speech. It, it's protected and I, I appreciate it. I do. But that's what's great about free speech is we get to have a conversation and a discourse, a discourse about it. We get to explore why such discourse may be hurtful or offensive, uh, and then maybe get into a deeper conversation about the significance of this particular image by Rockwell, and why that particular image does not, <laughs> should not necessarily be appropriated for this particular message. Because ultimately, um, I would hope that the artist um, would be able to, to understand more deeply the, the ramifications of that commentary and the appropriation of that image and that cultural moment in time. Um, and I hope that he would understand why his critics would be angry and upset or offended and even outraged by this appropriation of an important civil rights uh, uh, piece of art and 
a moment of historical significance. So to depict a woman born to wealth and power as being victimized in any way equivalent to a six-year-old child born to poverty in the segregated South uh, to illiterate parents is no way to bridge the divide he seems to be seeking to bridge. Uh, and that's what really gets me. I, I think his heart was in the right place. But if what he's trying to do is express um, his, his um, sympathy for DeVos and what he saw as hatred coming from protesters, this is not the way to, <laughs> to build bridges uh, you know, to other people, if you understand what I'm trying to say by that. Anyway, 9 o'clock, boom, right on time. Any questions, I'll be more than happy to stick around for five, ten minutes if you want to discuss this or if you want to go off mute, I'm more than happy to do that. Uh, I was really hoping to be a little faster with this, but I never seem to be. <laughs> um, if anybody would like, if anybody's got comments or you want to ask some questions, please feel free to do so. Or if you would like to um, verbalize it, please let me know. Um, Nothing. Naomi says, no. <laughs> uh, thank you, Chantel. She says, interesting topic. I'll research it more. Um, thank you, Renata. Uh, she says, uh, she shares my point and agree. And again, it's, it's okay if you don't agree. I just want you to, you know, I want everybody to be able to think about these things and really uh, engage in a deeper level conversation. Um, uh, Naomi says, sorry, there was no, there what, wait, sorry, the no was for a, oh, I gotcha, sorry. Um, Going back up. Uh, Jordan, you're welcome. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Uh, Kimberly, never really pay attention to the political tunes or two political cartoons, but I think this is this <laughs> after this I'm going to. But I'm glad to hear that. Uh, Jordan, interesting. Um, oh, I'm really interested in this type of art. Yeah, me too, Jordan. Um, and you know, again, it, Political cartoons are, are fascinating. I mean, you could have an entire 16-week uh, course just in political cartoons. And political cartoons have a centuries-long history. This is a core uh, aspect of American political culture. So, you know, you can go back to the middle of the, the seven, or 18th century and see some <laughs> pretty amazing uh, cartoons. Are, are just as controversial then as they are now. Um, excellent, Danielle. And again, if you click that, the uh, um, the medium.com link that I sent, there's a whole bunch of extra material in there and links to um, newspaper articles, uh, historical uh, websites, and things like that as well. Um, Jordan says, would you say this goes hand in hand with propaganda? Um, yeah, I mean, political cartoons tend to be, I wouldn't call them propaganda in, because propaganda tends to be uh, kind of couched in indivis indivisible or indivisibility or invisibility, I'm sorry. Um, propaganda isn't, doesn't come across as saying, hey, I'm satire, I'm a political cartoon. Propaganda tends to work um, on a more subconscious level. Um, propaganda doesn't come out and say, hey, I'm propaganda, uh, whereas I think political cartoons come out and say, hey, I'm clearly making, this is more like satire, um, but it certainly can, uh, it certainly can, and uh, it could support a certain uh, vein of propaganda. It could certainly uh, work in tandem with propaganda, absolutely. But again, I think political cartooning is, uh, you remember a, a couple of years ago with, with Charlie Hebdo and the, uh, the cartoon contest about um, Allah uh, and what the controversy of that, and that's a political, that's, France also has a very long 
long, strong tradition of political uh, cartooning as well. Uh, so I think it, it, for us in the West, this is a part of our, um, um, our, 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 our embrace of free speech, uh, our embrace of, of satire and making fun and poking fun at our political leaders, um, and at the same time making uh, very often deeply uh, significant social commentary as well. So I wouldn't call it propaganda per se, but it can certainly work with uh, certain types of propaganda. Uh, Chantel says those types of cartoons uh, say a lot about today. I absolutely agree. And I think right now more and more because things are so heated and so tense, um, you're seeing a lot more, um, you're seeing cartoons that are even edgier to some extent. One thing I didn't show you, there was actually a funny cartoon Funny, not ha ha. Funny, funny that it relates <laughs> to what we're talking about here. Um, if you go to that that article that I, I posted again, I've got it on that. Um, but in 2009, uh, another artist or cartoonist, uh, last name Lester, Mike Lester, I think, um, did the same thing. He he basically did his own version of uh, the problem we all live with by Rockwell, but instead of DeVos, it was Rush Limbaugh. And Rush Limbaugh was being uh, surrounded by, I think he said, the, the liberal press and uh, I don't know, some other. But it was basically saying that the, f the free speech advocates were kind of protecting the, 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 the hate speech of Rush Limbaugh. It's kind of funny because he looks like a little kid. He's in shorts, but he's got a big cigar. <laughs> the image is funny, even though it, it's, it's still kind of... Uh, an unusual message <laughs> and I still don't quite get what the guy was trying to say but uh, it's not as clear-cut as this one um, oh yeah Danielle no problem good to see you uh, the password is Ruby R-U-B-Y as in Ruby uh, Bridges and Danielle I think you I'm your instructor right I'm assuming you Danielle aren't you in my uh, modern and postmodern class Okay, well, that, that's what I thought. So yeah, you go ahead. You, nobody needs to stay any longer. I just want to stick around and see uh, if anybody had questions. But Ruby is your password. So if some of you might not be on the uh, internet, or I'm assuming everybody can see this, but if you're on the phone, the password, Jordan, you send that to your instructor if you've got an art history course. Um, art 1000, you don't get art or extra credit for this, but you will for uh, if you're taking 1020, 1030, um, or any other art history course. Just send them the password and you get 10 extra credit points. So it's just a little, little extra. Oh, Jordan, you're in my class too. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't recognize the name. Oh, Leanne, hi. Well, that's great. Yes, it is me, Jordan. Do send me the email though, because I'm not gonna. Oh, sorry, I forgot to change that. Yeah, it's me. The uh, account holder is Eric. I was I got in late, so I forgot to to uh, get in there. Chantel, you're very welcome, and have a good night as well. Um, not that it matters at this point, but. There you go. But Jordan and uh, Leanne and Danielle, just make sure you do send me that. Uh, I think she's probably gone, but just send me an email just as a reminder. I'm doing grades uh, tonight and tomorrow, um, so I'll add them then for you, okay? Uh, if there's no other question, oh, you're very welcome, Anna. Glad to do it. Just good timing. Uh, Kendall, no problem. Kendall, if you want to, you can send me an email. Um, I don't know if you want to write it down or if you're even interested, but I can send you uh, the PowerPoint and uh, the link to my article if you would like to look through it so you can actually see what we were talking about. Okay, I will send that to you. All right, everybody, have a wonderful evening, and uh, I appreciate your participation and all the comments, and I hope to see you in the future. Remember, we do these 
generally weekly. Um, once you signed up, you should be getting an invite from. If you don't get an invite, then that means we didn't have one for that week. But good night, Hannah. I'll talk to you soon. Um, but I will see you all in a future uh, session. And if you're in Art 1000, you might still see me in the Art 1000 Live. Uh, have a good night, everybody. And I'll see my students. I'll see you in class tomorrow on Wednesday. Good night, everybody. <laughs>